say hallelujah. hallelujah. Now turn to your neighbor and say neighbor. neighbor. I'm feeling good this morning. Good. Ain't got nothing to do with you. Ain't got nothing to do with me. It's got everything to do with the Lord. Amen. Anybody grateful to be alive this morning? Amen. Even in the middle of all this trouble, in the middle of all this struggle, even in the middle of all this empire, we are still grateful to be alive. Amen, somebody? Because we are the undefeatable. defeat this gospel. Now, I want to say good morning to you. Um, and was I, when I went around and, and introduced myself to people, okay, I, I got to keep the mic real close. That's going to hurt you all, all right? I'm just warning you right now because I have a big voice. But I, I feel like when I went around and introduced myself to folk, I felt like I already knew you because like Michael Ray, every Sunday, I'm in that little box right there watching you. I walked, I walked around and said, hey, how you doing this week? How you doing? Like I really knew people. I don't really know y'all. I know him. And I know some of you all. And I know the Lord. And I know you know the Lord here at The Way. Amen, somebody. I'm living in Battle Creek, Michigan. I call it the Frozen North. And uh, to see you all every Sunday is a real blessing. So I send my little hearts, my little thumbs ups. I feel good about it. I feel like I'm with you. Well, what a blessing it is to be here this morning with my dear brother. You know, what an introduction, my goodness. My mama couldn't have written a better introduction than that. And she, she had me. Um, but this is a generous cat, right? I mean, what a lovely, lovely brother, man. What a lovely brother. I mean, you know, there's lots of accolades you could put on Pastor Mike. Um, you know, freedom fighter, uh, change maker, a way maker, uh, powerful man of God, stand in the gapper, speak truth to power -er, <laughs> right? But he's just a beautiful cat. He's just a beautiful cat. He's a lovely, lovely human being. That's my word. That's, that's my word these days. I just say lovely all the time because, you know, I'm just, I'm grateful to be alive and I'm grateful to be a part of this resistance. Amen? Amen. You should feel grateful, too, to be on the winning side. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Act like you won. I'm grateful. And I want to honor my dear brother, uh, Michael Ray Matthews, uh, who's just penned an amazing book about the resistance. You can check it out on the website, theologyofresistance.org. Amen. And Pastor Ben, you know, my brother, we all, we all, um, you know, I say that we weren't in Ferguson. I say we served in Ferguson. And we served together. I served with this dear brother. I love this dear brother. You know, everybody go to jail differently, right? <laughs> Some people go to jail shaking. Oh, Lord. Mama told me never end up in jail, but here I am. Some people go to jail defiantly. Tighten up those cuffs on me. Well, we went to jail in, a, in an interesting way. We singing. We testifying. And we in those cells. And I was hungry myself. And they had those bologna sandwiches. You could tell who was raised good in the world with middle class. All the little middle class people. They weren't hungry. I know. I don't eat that. I don't eat that. That bologna sandwich on white bread, I ate two or three of those right there myself. You know? I said, can you fry, mama? Put that little cut in it so I can get at it. But I'm really grateful. I want to say hello to my beautiful wife of 35 years, Deborah, back home in Battle Creek. That's my heart, that's my soul. Uh, in the parlance of you young people, that's my boo. Um, and to my sons, Brandon and Ryan, who are beautiful, I adore them. They're grown men, but they're still my boys. I kiss them when I see them. They're like, Dad, you gotta stop that. <laughs> I, um, I love them. There was a time when I was the youngest person in, in, in all the rooms that I was in. And now look out on all you all and all these beautiful faces. And I'm probably the oldest cat in this house. So that feels good too, though. 
It felt good being the youngest, and now it feels good being the oldest. It's all a circle, right? But the circle really doesn't consummate itself in beauty unless you are in the circle with others. And thank goodness to the Lord, we are in the circle together this morning. Let us pray. Gracious and eternal God who is in heaven, wherever heaven is, but who is in our hearts, in our souls, and in our lives. This morning, Lord, we sit and we stand as a testimony to how good your grace is, to how good your mercy is, and to how well you love us. And so, Lord, we are paying attention in a troubled world, one not completely of our own making, but one that seduces us daily to be complicit in all of the hurt, harm, and danger that is projected onto defenseless people, children, and old folk, and grown folks who really have a mind to love you and to serve you well, Lord, but who, but who get caught up in this system. And so this morning, Lord, we want to dedicate our time together so that we might learn uh, more of you. And upon learning more of you, act more like you. Yes. Our Lord, this morning, our hearts are full of all kinds of emotions. Some of us are sad. Some of us are glad. Some of us are sick, in pain, depressed, worried, stressed, angry, unloved, and maybe feeling unlovable. But for the next few minutes, Lord, would you lift that from us? We give it to you so that we might hear your word, Lord. And my prayer this morning is that the people have not come to hear me, Lord. They have come to hear you. Hide me behind your cross. This we ask in the name of our risen Savior, our champion, our redeemer, Jesus Christ. If you love the Lord, say amen. 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 We want to use as a sermon topic, and I can't be long because I got a plane to catch. Y'all would be lucky I got a plane to catch because I would be long. I wouldn't do it intentionally, but you know, it just, it's like if he said, you know, it's just good, and you're just so thankful and grateful that you don't curse while you're doing it. But I want to use this sermon topic this morning Emmaus, the road to revolution. Touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, Emmaus, the road to revolution. Who, who's, who, who's on the road to revolution this morning? Who understands that we need a revolution this morning? All right, so some of us are. We're hopefully before this sermon is over. We'll all be on that road together because it's not exactly what you might think. Now, this is a long uh, scriptural reference for this sermon. So um, can you bear with me? I'm in the NRSV, the New Revised Study Bible. I call it the Anarchist Bible. It's the most progressive version of the Bible. Um, and uh, let's follow along a little bit. Uh, now, on that same day, I'll get, again, we're in Luke 24 and 13. Luke 24 and 13. Now, on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Cleopas answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there these days? He asked them, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now that third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group, someone say some women. Amen. I'm going to take every opportunity, as long as I preach this gospel, to insist that we understand some women. Amen, somebody. Some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us they indeed had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as 
those women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As it came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went, so he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they, someone say, eyes were open. They, they were open, and, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour, they got that same hour. Y'all know what time it is by now, right? That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem and they found the 11 and their companions gathered together. They were saying the Lord has risen indeed and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and now he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. A story about a walk on a road, a journey to Emmaus. Why were they on the road that day, church? Why were those two walking on the road from Jerusalem to Emmaus when all the other brethren and sisterin were holed up, hiding out, unsure of if whether or not it was safe to move around. Why were they on the road that day? We should ask these questions when we read this scripture because the Lord has given us a good mind and we ought to ask plenty of questions and try to get to the root of, this, the, root of the story. And if you can't find the answers yourself, then you, you ought to turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, help me understand. See, this Bible thing, this church thing, this faith thing is a participatory thing. It don't come from up here to you. It comes in and among all of us. Amen. So why were they on the road that day? Were they so saddened, so heartbroken that they felt they had to run? Were they afraid and felt threatened and unsafe given their affiliation with Jesus, the King of Righteousness? Were they on that road because when you are hurt or scared or anxious or depressed or otherwise shook, you tend to put your body in action and go through the motions of trying to change your circumstances without necessarily changing yourself. But it usually amounts to little more than just running in place. You ever been in that place where you're not really certain how to go forward and the world is dangerous and, and falling in on you. You're not sure what to do. And so you just start moving and you do this and you do that. Move there, move that, say this and say that. Never without a plan or a strategy, but just feeling that if I just get moving, somehow it'll come. Somehow I'll figure it out. Somehow the revelation will happen. And that's maybe why they were on the road that day. And aren't we them? And isn't the story about us? Aren't some of us running in place this morning? On the road, but going nowhere? Are you running in circles, saints of God? Same old people, same old circumstances, same old problems, same old worries, same old anxieties, same old frustrations, same old lies, same old broken promises. Aren't we like these two travelers? They had witnessed something terrible, the unthinkable. Their friend, their prophet had been taken from them by the unrighteous acts of state authority. And that authority exercised its prerogative, the prerogative that it gives itself to value or devalue life and therefore devalue the life of their dear friend and spiritual master. And it reserved for itself the right to determine which life had value and wish life mattered. Not unlike, not unlike the state authority that we are living with and contending with today. Eleanor Bumpers. Amadou Diallo. Natasha McKenna. Oscar Grant. Trayvon Martin. Sandra Bland. Rakia Boyd, Eric Gardner, Alton Sterling, and little Tamir Rice. 
Didn't the system reserve for itself the authority to devalue their lives? And aren't you concerned this morning that that very same system has taken upon itself the authority to value or devalue your life? Aren't you concerned that this same system has taken upon itself to value or devalue the lives of the dear ones sitting next to you? Turn your eyes and let them, let them just bathe across the people around you. Go ahead and ask yourself why you're doing that. Aren't these people important? Don't their lives matter? Is it any wonder, church, that in the eyes of the established authority, in the eyes of the rich and powerful, in the eyes of the empire, the life of a poor man of color from a nowhere town and a nowhere people who nonetheless had a head full of wisdom, a heart full of love, a mouth full of righteous words that challenged not just the authority, but the fundamental conditions of the human race. Is it any wonder that that empire would find him lacking and insufficient in value so that his life would not be spared, but would be taken from him without counsel, without permission, without regard for our way we felt about it, without our protest, without recognizing that they, they may not have loved him, but we loved him. Yeah. Were they running because of that? And are you running because of that? God bless you, young people, because the world that we handed you and the world that you have seen, it is not the world that was alive in our imagination. It is not the world that I had hoped to bring my children into. Ferguson was not my first protest. It was not my first tear gassing. It was not my first jailing. And I operated like the brave brothers and sisters of my generation, hoping that our actions on those days would create better days in these days. Were they fleeing because they were afraid they would be hunted down, rounded up, detained, deported, arrested, incarcerated, given a bail too high to pay, put on trial without the resources for an adequate defense, mistreated, brutalized, put in solitary lockdown, and even executed in a backwater town in a southern state known for his cruelty and put to death with a lethal injection that would surely cause great suffering and inhumane misery. Or were they on that road because they were just tired? Tired of the struggle for dignity. Tired of the constant fending off of the micro and macro aggressions of people who were commanded by God to love them but did not love them. Were they just tired? Tired of the code switching and the mask wearing and the faking it and never making it. Were they just tired of trying to serve two masters, the heavenly masters and that master card? Were they just tired of being broke, being held back, being alone, being lonely? One night stands and late night liaisons with people who desired your body but did not love your heart. Were they tired of marching and tired of protesting and tired of demonstrating and tired of sitting in and dying in? Were they tired of voting for the lesser of two evils and getting the devil anyhow? Were they tired of public policies that count winners among the elite and assign privileges based on white skin and losers? The sign losers to the poor, the colored, the young, the old, the gay. Were they just tired touch of the whole damned thing? We may not know why they were on the road, that road to Emmaus, but you know why you are on the road you're on. And we know why this nation is on the road that it is on. The road, the road, the road. Somebody say the road. You see, church, you won't ever go anywhere towards your own ambitions or towards your own fulfillment or towards your own happiness, even towards your own personal liberation or the liberation of your people if you don't get on this road for real. It has been said that life is a journey and not a destination. Well, I try to look at it a, a little differently. I try to look at it through Christ's eyes. Life is a journey with a destination. A journey with a destination. And if it is a journey with a destination, then you, my dear brothers and sisters, are consequential. 
You matter. Your plans, ambitions, desires, they count for something. You have a right to that road. You belong on that road and not just by yourself. But in order to get where your heart or your passion or your goals or even your moral compass is leading you, you must commit to this journey. You must commit to the road. I just sister said I talked yesterday about intention. And I want to speak to you about intention. I want you to intend to breathe right now. I want you to intend your heart to beat right now. I want you to intend to be able to see out of your eyes and smell out of your nose and feel with your hands. I want you to intend that. And you say, uh, uh, dear, dear pastor, I, I don't have to really intend that. You see, that's, that's kind of automatic. It just kind of runs on its own. I, I ain't even consciously thinking about that. Well, that's what intention is. You're so determined. It's so right. Your system's all together. You don't even have to think about it. You don't have to deliberate on it. You don't have to sit in the midnight hour and ask yourself yes or no, right or wrong, which way, right or left. If it is intention, it's natural. And so what are our intentions this morning? Two point five million of our brothers and sisters in prison, 12 million children being raised in this country with at least one incarcerated adult. For people can't find work. School don't matter. The bills are too high. And someone in Washington is rattling. The war sabers. It used to be that. If there were tense times where nuclear weapons were involved. We acted very discreetly and handled things very um, secretly and hopefully very responsibly, although that's never assured. But now you have a regime that callously displays the nuclear football and talks about people, whole countries acting very bad and they're going to, have to do something about it. If we are going to be on this road, we're going to have to be intentional. If you're going to be on this road, you're going to have to will yourself into a whirlwind. Now, consider that. And consider the consequence of that. If you get on this road, the road that leads to revolution, the road that leads to love, the road that leads to a better world, the road that allows you to embrace your neighbor, hug them around their neck, play with little children in a meadow, and drink water from a country stream. If you want to get on that road, you've got to step into a whirlwind. You've got to step into a mystery. But I'm here to tell you, thanks to the Lord, you get to step into a fuller life. Yeah. Every journey worth taking has to start somewhere. My journey, my personal journey began in poverty. In a historically racist city. In one of its most marginalized neighborhoods. During the height of not the new Jim Crow. But during the height of the old Jim Crow. My journey began in racial oppression, denial of my human and God-given rights, the forced designation as a second-class person, and the denial of my intelligence, my beauty, my melanated black skin, my old-time religion, my faith in my ancestors, my love for the earth, and my deep regard for others like me in the struggle. That's where I... That's where my journey began. And I got on this road because I was lost. And I was hurt. And I had been denied and I had been beat down. And I was discouraged. When my parents got divorced, my father died. My mother struggled with the burden of raising three children alone. When they told me I was too dumb to go to college, 
too black to aspire to greatness, too unsophisticated to lead a company or an organization. I got on the road. I got on the road. And I'm on the road still. You know why, church? I got nowhere else to go. I got nowhere else to go. And somebody here this morning knows exactly what I'm talking about. You've had it up to here and beyond. This is not just about, this is not just a sermon about your own personal circumstance. The time is too late for those sermons, I'm afraid. But if we can't get you into shape to fight this fight, then we'll never win the fight. And so we have to use these moments to not only prepare ourselves individually, but understand from that how we prepare ourselves collectively. Because this road to revolution has too few travelers right now. And we need to fill the streets up, fill the roads up, fill the byways up, fill the highways up. We all got to get on this road. But understand, I did what I felt I had to do which is what our foremothers and forefathers must have done. You know what they did, right? All those things they were telling you as a child was not for entertainment. They were trying to prepare you for, they could see prophetically this moment. Hardship, suffering. If it's done closely alloyed with God, gives you a prophetic wisdom that you can transcend time and see way out into the future. And they saw this day coming. And they buckled up their shoes, hitched up their pants, and they tightened up the belts on their skirts, and they found the nearest on-ramp to this road. And they got on this road, and they've been on this road for 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600 years, almost a millennium. And I will not permit you or I To be the one space in our history, in our time, where there was no one on the road. Where we abandoned the road. Abandoned one another and abandoned our commitment to struggle. But understand, the road goes more uphill than down. There are more sharp curves that threaten to throw you over the guardrails than straight stretches that guide you forward. There are more potholes detours, and under construction signs than well-paved HOV lanes. They ain't got those in Michigan, but they got them here in California. This road even got some blind alleys, some dark streets, and even some dead ends. So, So what should we name this road then? This road with so much trouble and yet so important, could we call it the road to perdition? How about the road that goes nowhere and then it just fizzles out? Shall we name it the road, shall we name it misery? Or or should we name it oppression and degradation? Or shall we name this road revolution? Revolution. Revolution. I like that one. I want to name this road revolution. Because you see, church, we need a revolution. And we need a revolutionary road. One that can hold revolutionaries. For revolution means not what you think it means. Revolution means to turn. To move on an axis or a central point. To move in a circle, which is the only perfect geometric shape. So the question is, what is our axis, church? What is our central point? What is our revolution? Well, I'm here to tell you, those of us who still profess the faith in Jesus Christ will tell you, That this road called revolution, the axis, the central turning point, this road is the road that Jesus is on. He is our axis and his revolutionary message of defiant, outrageous, exorbitant, radical love his standing up for the poor and the powerless, his sacrifice of the earthly for the heavenly, his elevation of godly authority over earthly authority, his determination to heal the sick, 
clothe the naked, and set the captives free. That is our central point. Jesus is our axis, his mission, his message, his gospel is our central turning point. So then, as I get ready to take my seat, let's just walk a second more with our dear brother Cleopas and, who, and his companion, who was likely his wife. Right? And it says that while they were walking along the road and Jesus was talking to them, their hearts were burning. Uh, it wasn't indigestion. <laughs> Although when you get my age, <laughs> free confession for the news. It wasn't indigestion. Their hearts were burning. And I have a very important question to ask you this morning. If you want to get on this road. Is your heart burning? I mean, is it really burning for God? Is your heart burning for liberation? Is your heart burning for freedom? Is your heart burning for just a modicum of well-being and happiness and joy and satisfaction that not only you are taking care of, but your neighbor is taking care of as well? Is your heart burning for the love and the affection of your neighbors, your family, and your friends? Reach out and grab your neighbor's hand. Is your heart burning for that? Oh, don't let this baby not have a hand to hold. Right. Is your heart burning for that? Can you feel that amazing, awesome creation at the other end of your hand? Is your heart deeply, deeply burning for that? Turn and look at that neighbor. And can you look at them and just for a second regard them as beautiful? Is your heart burning for that kind of beauty? Is it confirmation that God is still on this road. Put a smile on your face for a second, even if you don't mean it, <laughs> right? But is your heart burning for that kind of joy, that kind of release? Squeeze that hand a little bit harder. Is your heart burning for affection and closeness and love and nurturance? If your heart is burning for that, you've got to get on this road. You've got to get on it. You've got to get on it. Oh, I wish I had a praying church. I wish someone get on this road with me. Here I come, Lord, I'm on this road. 